Well, hello and welcome back to another installment in our series, Going to the Source. Uh, today, we will be taking a look at a letter written by Richard Frethorn, a tale of woe and misery, and talking a little bit about what it meant to the Virginia Company then and what it means to us today. So the source that we're looking at today is a letter penned by the hand uh, of a young man by the name of Richard Frethorn. And uh, he is, at this point, newly arrived in the colony, originally from uh, London, from the parish of St. Dunstan in the East. And he's, again, a very young man, maybe as young as 12, and would appear that his indenture uh, to the company was, was perhaps not as, uh, as voluntary as some of the others that are coming here. Um, it is believed that his family uh, may have been on, on uh, poor relief and the parish basically providing this means of employment as uh, a means of, of alleviating expenses, both for the parish and for the family and this sort of thing. And so this, this young man uh, has arrived here in Virginia uh, in the aftermath of the attack in 1622. So this is a little bit further in to the colonial experience here than some of the other sources we've looked at thus far. Uh, and he is writing in 1623. So in the year, the aftermath of uh, the attack in, in 1622 as, as the colony is, is struggling. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on, on the brink and it's, it, the, the entire colony is struggling. Uh, and this letter is significant for us because it does come from one of the rank and file, one of the, uh, well, for, for, for lack of a, a better term, a, a, a relative nobody. You know, he's so often what we look at are the sources that come to us from the command leadership of the company or the colony. This young man is, is simply one of the rank and file. Um, and so it's rare to see their words, their own story, you know, written by their hand, preserved down through the centuries. Um, and so this is, this is a, a rare and very, a very useful resource for us. Um, and to just... Get a little bit of an idea. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a, a look at, at the beginning uh, of the letter here. Uh, as he is writing, in this case, he wrote more than one letter that's actually survived through the years, but in this case, it's the letter to his own parents. <clears throat> and he starts, uh, Loving and kind father and mother, my most humble duty remembered to you, hoping in God of your good health, as I myself am at the making there hereof. Uh, basically saying, Hope this finds you well. I'm doing okay at the moment, at the time of writing. I'm, I'm all right. Uh, this is to let you understand that I, your child, am in a most heavy case by reason of the country, which is such that it causeth much sickness, such as the scurvy and the bloody flux and diverse other diseases, which maketh the body very poor and weak. And when we are sick, there is nothing to comfort us. For since I came out of the ship, I ate, uh, I ate, I never ate anything but peas and loblolly. As for deer or venison, I never saw any since I came into this land. Uh, there is indeed some fowl, but we are not allowed to go and get it, but must work hard both early and late for a mess of water gruel and a mouthful of bread and beef. A mouthful, a mouthful of bread for a penny loaf must serve for four men, which is most pitiful. Now, the conditions in the colony are in quite a bad state, as he's laid out just there. Um, is it exactly the same throughout the entire colony? No, you probably got varying levels depending on which settlement you're at. Uh, might not have been quite as bad at Jamestown. Uh, but overall, the colony's in rough shape. You know, with a remarkably well-coordinated attack on behalf of the Palatine chiefdom a year earlier, a third of the colony's population uh, had been destroyed uh, and lost a tremendous amount of ground and resource. Um, and in the surviving population, basically being driven to retreat to, to stronger, more, more fortified positions, 
uh, you've now got the population concentrated and you know famine and illness becoming a bigger issue again uh, as they had been in, in some of the earliest years of the colony. Uh, and so yeah, this is this is sort of laying out in a, a condition that is again varying but but similar across the colony. Um, these men are being pushed to work uh, exceedingly hard to try to make up the losses of the Virginia Company, to try to turn that profit that the company needs in order to keep operating. And the company has very little in the way of resources to support them. Uh, so, you know, imagine, you know, working double shifts on starvation rations. I mean, that's, that's kind of the idea that we're being, being laid out here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, again, this, this seems to be fairly consistent with a lot of what's going on in the colony. He goes on, he talks about the mortality rate at the particular settlement that he's living at. Uh, which has been quite high just since he's been there. Uh, and he makes the point uh, basically saying that uh, after all this, this high mortality rate, he says, so that we are fain to get other men to plant with us, and yet we are but 32 to fight against 3,000 if they should come. Basically saying conditions have gotten bad enough at Martin's 100 that they're, they're not going to be successful in recruiting anyone else to come and live at Martin's 100, and yet they need help. Um, they're still convinced that, that at any moment, you know, the second shoe is going to drop um, from the Powhatan. They could be attacked again, and on top of everything, yeah, again, they've, they've, they've got to be trying to do their jobs, trying to make money for the Virginia Company. Um, this is something that comes up also uh, numerous times not just in, in the discussion of this era, but the starving time and all the other periods of famine. You know, there's so much resources available in Virginia. Why are they going hungry? And he's saying, well, well, I haven't seen any deer since I've been here. There's plenty of fowl, ducks, geese, that kind of thing. Um, but we're not given any opportunity to go and try to harvest it, to go and try to make use of it. Um, and so, you know, you, you've got that, that unfortunate kind of balance of, you know, okay, do we try to feed them with what we've got and devote all of their time to trying to make money, or do we take some of that time and let them go try to feed themselves, and, you know, there's there's not really a great balance to be had either way in that situation. He says, I, I, I have nothing to comfort me, nor is there nothing to be gotten here but sickness and death, except in the event that one had money to lay out in some things for profit. But I have nothing at all, no, not a shirt to my back, but two rags, nor clothes, but one poor suit, nor but one pair of shoes, and no, uh, uh, but one pair of stockings, one cap, and but two bands, the, the co collars. Uh, my cloak is stolen by one of my fellows, and to his dying hour he would not tell me what he did with it. But some of my fellows saw him have butter and beef out of a ship, which my cloak I doubt not paid for. So that I have not a penny nor a penny worth to help me to either spice or sugar or strong waters, without which one cannot live here. Now there's a lot in there. Not only is he saying, you know, my existence is threadbare. I basically got one outfit and it's not a good one at that. But he's, he's remarking on the health of the situation, you know. Um, hygiene concerns in the time period. You're supposed to have multiple shirts. You're supposed to have clean linen against your skin every day. You're supposed to be able to shift your linens, to rotate your shirts. Um, and he doesn't even have a shirt. He's got a couple of rags to tie together under his suit. Um, and, you know, he, I mean, he had a cloak and this guy stole it from him and probably traded it to sailors to get some better provisions out of the sailor's ship than what they're being provided. Um, and then apparently didn't do him any good. He got he sick and died anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, he's going on to saying, uh, you know, he's, he's got nothing of value to trade anymore, nor does he have any money to buy to get things that are going to help his health. Um, so he says spice, sugar, or strong waters. Basically, what we're looking at there are, are things that we would see today as luxury items. You know, any kind of, of, of spirit or alcoholic beverage um, and things to you know, improve the palatability of a meal. Historically, they're viewing these things as being directly impactful to your health. 
Um, you know, we, we see, for instance, uh, you know, for as strong beer in England doth fatten and strengthen them, so water here does doth wash and weaken. Uh, and 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 say and it only it only keeps life and soul together. Uh, you know the idea that these sorts of things kind of stoke an internal fire, if you will. That that they do genuinely improve your health, not just your your spiritual well being of having something that's a little bit more enjoyable, but that they actually do improve your health. Um, and he's saying, I've got none of these things to supplement my diet. To help improve my health. So all I've got is this very poor, meager ration that the Virginia Company is providing me and no means to to supplement it. You know, so he's he's basically saying, you know, I'm doomed to have constantly degrading health given given the conditions that I'm living in. Um, and he's basically then goes on to say that the only reason he's made it as far as he has uh, is by uh, the um, the charity of another colonist, a gunsmith whom he names as Goodman Jackson uh, at uh, Jamestown. Basically, every time he and, the, and, and his fellows from, from Martin's Hundred are sent to Jamestown on business, uh, this gunsmith and his wife uh, put him up for the night, feed him, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, refortify his, his body, as it were, a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're 10 miles away from Jamestown, even taking the goods from Martin's hundred to Jamestown, he talks about as, as being sort of a, a grueling task, um, talking about getting stuck on the boats in foul weather out in the river before they can even make it to Jamestown and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, you know, all the way around, he's, he's presenting this image of, just a destitute, sort of hopeless existence, um, which kind of brings us to the point of his letter. He's asking for help. Um, he's first got to lay out why he is in need of help and why he is not in a situation to be able to help himself. Um, and, uh, you know, and he's, he's also, yeah, yeah, he's, he's genuinely asking for help He's trying a lot of different tacks to try to get it, um, and he's he's perhaps plying, trying to apply a little bit of, of guilt as well um, in referring again to this this gunsmith that's been taking pity on him. Uh, he says, and he much marveled that you would send me a servant to the company. He saith I had been better knocked on the head. Uh, so you know, making it clear that the gunsmith doesn't think this is something that he would have done for, for his own offspring. Um, now, again, it's possible that the family may not have had a tremendous amount of, of option in this circumstance. Um, but he then goes on uh, to, uh, to say, uh, basically to, to make his point, to, to, to get to his request. Uh, and he says, and indeed, so I find it now to my great grief and misery and I saith that if you love me, you will redeem me suddenly, for which I do entreat and beg. And if you cannot get the merchants to redeem me for some little money, basically saying, if you can't buy my contract and get me out of here. Uh, he says, then for God's sake, get a gathering or entreat some good folks to lay out some little sum of money in meal and cheese and butter and beef. Any eating meat will yield great profit. Oil and vinegar is very good, but, Father, there is great loss in leaking. But for God's sake, send beef and cheese and butter, or the more of the one sort and not none of the other. But if you send cheese, it must be very old cheese. And at the cheesemongers, you may buy very good cheese for two pence farthing or a half penny, uh, and that will be liked very well. But if you send cheese, you must have care how you pack it in barrels, and you must put Cooper's chips between every cheese or else the heat of the hold will rot them. Now this tells us all kinds of stuff. Uh, one, it tells us he doesn't have any great hope that his parents are going to actually be able to buy out his contract. He knows the circumstance that they're in um, uh, financially. And so he says, if you can't do that, then you know, basically ask for a donation, get some people together and see if people will pool their money and buy some provisions to be shipped here. Now, certainly he's probably going to eat some of it himself, but he's more worried about 
being able to trade and sell those provisions himself so that he can make money, so that he can either better his condition at the very least or perhaps buy his own way out of service faster. Either way. Um, and while we are most concerned with his story, his experience, uh, and, and such here, um, it does give us some interesting insight. You know, he's talking about um, while, you know, oil and vinegar, um, things to preserve food, to dress food, to cook food. Um, he's saying, yes, those would be very good. He's saying those would be very good. Uh, but that, uh, you, know, you, you know, great loss in leaking. Uh, so in theory uh, here saying, you know, okay, the, the containers that they'll be shipped in, you know, it's not all going to make it. So if you want something that's got the better chance to be all profit on this end and not lose any on the way, you know, send, send the dry goods, send the meat, the butter, the cheese. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and even something as simple as, well, how do you pack cheese and get it across the ocean 400 years ago? That's a neat little uh, insight as well. Saying, one, you've, you've got to get old cheese, which means, you know, hard, dry, aged cheese that is not going to be carrying enough moisture to suddenly spoil. Um, and you know, even laying out the manner in which it's packed so that it doesn't spoil in the heat of the hold. Um, you know, that kind of thing. It is... Uh, it is some, some interesting little tidbits there as well. He uh, goes on to, 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 to sort of close. He says, and, and, and look whatsoever you send me, be it never so much. Look whatever I make of it, I will deal truly with you. I will send it over and beg the prophet to redeem me. And if I die before it come, I have entreated Goodman Jackson to send you the worth of it, who hath promised he will. Now, he's also telling them, if you send anything, you've got to send it to the gunsmith. If you send it just to me, it's not going to get to me. Send it to the gunsmith. He's got, you know, plenty of parcels coming and going. It'll get to him. Um, and he's saying, basically, if you buy the stuff and send it here, I will sell it. And you will make the money off of it. And I'm just going to use, I, I'm going to pay you back, essentially. And I'm only going to use the profit that I can make of it to try to redeem myself from this place. Um, and going so far as saying, if you spend the money and I'm dead before it gets here, I've made sure that somebody else makes sure you get your money back. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of heartbreaking as well. You imagine writing a letter to your parents saying, can you please save me? And if you spend the money trying to save me and it doesn't save me, I'll make sure you still get your money back. And that's, that's kind of tough. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he, he goes uh, at one point in the letter, he says, and, and this is an important one point in the letter, he says uh, that, you know, you, you give beggars at your door more than we are given here for a day's allowance. If we are correct in that his family is receiving poor assistance, they're clearly not well off. You can imagine how little a beggar at their door would be receiving. Almost certainly foodstuffs, not actually you know, monetary charity. And that makes that line all the more poignant when we realize that even a poor family's donations to the poor are still greater than what these guys in Virginia are receiving. Um, that's that's heavy. Um, he uh, he closes out. And he says, "Good father, do not forget me, but have mercy and pity." Uh, pity my per my miserable case. Uh, I know if you did but see me, you would weep to see me, for I have but one suit. So again, coming back to his 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 uh, rather pitiful wardrobe. <laughs> Wherefore, God's sake, pity me. I pray you to remember my love to all my friends and kindred. I hope all my brothers and sisters are in good health. And as for my part, I have set down my resolution that certainly will be. That is, that the answer of this letter will be life or death to me. Therefore, good father, send as soon as you can, 
And if you send me anything, let this be the mark. And he puts down what should be marked on any packages that are sent. Um, that's, again, a heavy way to close out there, basically saying the response to this letter is going to decide whether or not I live or die. They say his life is quite literally and realistically in their hands. Um, so it, it, it lays out a pretty bleak um, a pretty, a pretty bleak picture. Uh, and again, it's hard to imagine that this would have been in any way a unique theme at that time. One of the most miserable periods of time for the colony. And unfortunately, you know, records indicate that um, young Richard didn't live a whole lot longer. Um, so whether his parents tried to send anything or not, we don't know. Uh, but uh, the young man, unfortunately, didn't make it. And so it would appear that he was not exaggerating overly much um, with, uh, with these conditions. Uh, but again, this is an important letter. Um, in, in a lot of ways, it is important to us to finally get to see some insight from someone low ranking in the company. It's important um, to get that sort of human connection. And it's got some value in some ways in which you might not initially expect, which is why it has survived down through the centuries. So again, the, the letter, a letter from someone so low ranking, one of the rank and file is rare for a reason, because generally they're not considered to be important enough documents to be stored carefully enough to last through the centuries. So why was this one? And it's because it paints such a bleak picture of life in Virginia. And you've got what you've got by this point, you've got various factions within the administration of the Virginia Company vying for control of the company. And one faction is trying to paint as rosy a picture as possible um, to try to present a good face to the investors and that sort of thing. Um, and as opposition, of course, sees this letter as opportunity uh, to, to prove, say, hey, look, things aren't going well, and this is why we need a change of administration. So we see uh, the Smith faction, Sir Thomas Smith uh, faction, uh, sort of representing the interests of investors who've got them. Smith himself is the wealthiest man in all of England. They've got the money to be able to wait for a long-term yield or even to be able to appreciate the overall economic benefits of the existence of the colony, even if their investment doesn't necessarily pay off. They can afford to lose the money that they've put into the company if necessary. Not that they want to, but um, we've got then, uh, you know, Sir Edwin Sams and his sort of faction within the company who really need to see profit and need to see it as soon as possible. Um, and then we have the Earl of Warwick who wants not only a profitable return, he genuinely wants to realize Spain's greatest fear and make Jamestown essentially a, a base of, of, of piracy, of, of privateering actions against Spanish shipping and Spanish colonies and that sort of thing. Um, and the uh, young Richard's letter finds its way into the possession of the Earl of Warwick. Um, and uh, we see uh, basically he, him using his faction allied with uh, the, the Sands faction, using that and other documents as leverage to sort of wrest control of, of the company um, from you know, Smith and his faction. And then, uh, and then Sands and Warwick have a falling out because as much as Warwick wants you know, the, the piracy angle, Sands doesn't. Um, and, and we, see, we see a lot of that playing into, you know, the overall um, story of the colony, a lot of that playing into other major events that, that, that we talk about. Uh, the treasurer, one of the 
the, the two ships that bring the first documented Africans to Virginia. Um, you know, Captain Samuel Argyll and, and his family's ship. Well, it turns out Earl of Warwick has some interest in that vessel. Um, investing in the ship itself or the expedition, we're not sure, but um, you know, he's 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 tied into the whole thing. Um, and, and in even a larger sense, he's also investing in, in expansion in New England and with the East India Company. And so he, you know, he's, again, spread around far and wide. Um, and so this, this, this feeds into that bigger picture. Again, this, this one poor kid's letter is simply seen as leverage for this really wealthy, really powerful wheeler and dealer to try to achieve his end. And it's the only reason that we still have young Richard Fredhorn's voice to read four centuries later. Um, and it's important to bear these things in mind. Yes, we're very grateful to have this young man's voice, this young man's experience. Uh, but it's important to bear in mind why it was preserved at all in the first place for us to still be able to read it. Well, thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed uh, this installment. Uh, and if so, please, as always, like. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a comment, uh, and we'll catch you next time.